Transmissions from Hawaii is supported in part by Hawaii Ship. Hawaii Ship is a federally funded volunteer based program administered by the Hawaii Department of Health Executive Office on Aging. Their Medicare certified counselors provide free, unbiased local counseling to beneficiaries, their loved ones, caregivers, and soon to be retirees. They are recruiting multilingual volunteers to assist clients and translate brochures. Request a free consultation or join their winning team of volunteers on their website at hawaiiship.org. That's hawaiiship.org. Transmissions from Hawaii. Producer Tony Vega here, and as some of you may be aware, this podcast is essentially a spin-off of Wasabi Magazine. So Wasabi is a magazine published in Hawaii. We started publishing in 2018, and it ran until 2020 when we put it on indefinite hold due to the pandemic. So after we did that, we started looking at other things we could do, and that eventually led to the creation of this podcast. So we had already worked on a whole lot of stories about Hawaii and people here uh, for the magazine. And so I couldn't help but think about how I could adapt some of these into this new audio format. So I looked around a bit and eventually settled on the story that you're going to hear today. So today you're going to hear some audio clips from an interview that we did in 2018. And in these clips, you're also going to hear the voice of one of our writers. Her name is Phoebe Neal. She ended up writing an article that ran in the February, March, 2019 issue of Wasabi based on the interview that you're going to hear clips from. Now, I won't say anything else because I don't want to spoil the story. So here it is, Memoir of a Hilo Waterman. You know, I got to tell you a little story. Uh When I was a kid, I was fascinated with water. Uh-huh. People rain all the time. Yeah. They had beautiful sunny days. When I was a little youngster, mm-hmm. I used to put out the Japanese called Tarai. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the uh, iron tub. Mm-hmm. I put it out in the garage and take it out in the front yard where we have a dip and get the garden hose, fill it up. And I was a nudist from the time I was a child. And I was black. I was dark. Really, really dark. That's Richard Tanabe Jr., better known as Sonny. Born in 1934, Sonny is a former Olympic swimmer, educator, and author from the Big Island. But anyway, uh, uh, some of my parents' friends were looking for Tanabe, Dick Tanabe's house. Mm-hmm. And so our name down the street, uh, this guy was born his lawn. This guy's driving, he's walking around. He says, stop by, he says to this guy, hey, where's uh, Dick Tanabe's house over here? He said, oh, just go down the street. It's on the right hand side. He said, just uh, look up. Oh, down the next block. He said, you see a dark little kid in the, in the water, in the pan. That's the house. That, that's the kind of reputation I got. <laughs> <laughs> Like many other kids of the time, Sonny spent his childhood playing in the water, fishing, and running around barefoot. However, the start of World War II would bring with it difficult times, especially for those of Japanese ancestry like Sonny. No longer was Sonny able to go fishing with his uncle or swimming with his friends. Nevertheless, Sonny and his friends found ways to still enjoy themselves even during these trying times. During you know, the time of the war, war the ocean, they wouldn't yeah. let you go because okay. we had a uh, martial law mm-hmm. yeah. and blackouts. And mm-hmm. So they had military marines patrolling mm-hmm. our streets, mm-hmm. and uh, we went you know, with rifles and everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember when we were kids, we used to like to play, especially in the summertime when the day was long and hot. Uh, the kids used to play at a the military used to march down the streets. But what we would do is wait till a guy passed us, we'd cross the street over to friend's house <laughs> and play in the yard, talk mm-hmm. story. And that's all. And then I think the Marines knew that we were doing that. Mm-hmm. They let us do it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 
all the windows were, you know, painted black, blackout. Mm-hmm. We had that curtains, and they had a, a wardens come around, civil defense wardens come around to check for lights and everything like that. It wasn't until after the end of the war when Sonny would enter into the world of competitive swimming. Basically by accident. Even though he was a self-described water bug, Sonny was never particularly interested in swimming competitively. But in the summer of 1949, when Sonny and his friends were getting together as part of a summer league to play sports, one of Sonny's friends proposed the idea to him. Uh, all our kids around the day would all gather together and would have different activities, playing different kind of ball games with uh, different groups and so forth. And the whole summer, uh, we met there during the day and played. Okay, uh, at the end of the summer in August, uh, they said, we're going to have a swimming meet. Would anybody like to come out for, to try, you know, go in the swim, swim meet? Nobody wanted to do that. So they were all interested more in softball, baseball type of game. Mm-hmm. And so one guy uh, told me, Sonny, let's go do that. Let's go swim. Though hesitant, Sonny agreed to participate in two events in his first swim meet. And much to his own surprise, he won both. I swam in this meet. I swam the 50 back choke, 50 yard freestyle. And I was really fortunate. I won both events yeah. against mm-hmm. uh, swimmers that were swimming on the club. No. <laughs> yeah. So immediately, the swimming coach... Uh, Sparky called Moro, asked me to come out. I said, oh, I'm not a swimmer. I said, I don't like swimming. <laughs> I like basketball, you know, baseball, that kind of thing. I said, I don't like swimming. Even after the unexpected victories, though, Sonny wasn't fully convinced that swimming was for him. But Richard Tanabe Sr., Sonny's dad, seemed to be of a different perspective because he proposed a deal to Sonny, and it was that deal that would end up changing Sonny's mind. My dad said, you go out for swimming for three months. At the end of the year, if you don't like swimming, you can quit and play other sports. I said, okay, good. Then I won't have anybody on my back. <laughs> so I did that. And in the process, I really enjoyed it. While attending Hilo High School, Sonny was selected for the prestigious National Interscholastic All-American team, and it wasn't long before he was competing at the highest levels alongside top-class swimmers from Hawaii, such as Ford Kono, Yoshi Oyakawa, and Bill Woolsey. When it came time for college, Sonny found himself in a pretty good position. His times in the pool had attracted the attention of more than one school, and they were all vying for his attention. Uh, I graduated in 1953, and I, was, I signed my verbally contract to go to the University of Florida. Oh, really? And I went to Hypnopics to swim in the Nationals. I did real well. I was on the national team, and we swam in Bermuda. Hmm. But while I was there, the swimming coach from Florida uh, at the Nationals grabbed me by the hand and led me all over the place mm-hmm. so I wouldn't be able to talk to coaches. It was so they don't take you somewhere yeah. else, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they were all trying to talk to Bill Woolsey and myself. In the end, though, it was the promise of a full scholarship and his desire to attend the same school as fellow Hawaii swimmer and future roommate Bill Woolsey that convinced Sonny to pick Indiana University. There, Sonny would be named to the NCAA All-American team from 1955 to 1957, and it was also during this time that Sonny would be selected for the U.S. swim team that would compete in the 1956 Summer Olympics in Melbourne, Australia. During the Olympic Games, I think the biggest thing was that we were representing our country and swimming us the rest of the world. In Melbourne, Sonny swam in the preliminary round of the 4x200 freestyle relay. And when I got to uh, Melbourne, we had a swim off and the fastest four got on there. And guess who was the fifth person? Me. 
The U.S. team, which included two members from Hawaii, Ford Kono and Bill Woolsey, ended up taking home the silver medal, coming in after Australia. Unfortunately though, due to rules that have since been changed, Sonny was not awarded a medal for his team's victory. So I swam with the preliminaries in the morning. We swam against Japan hmm. on a relay. And we qualified and we all got to the finals. But to find the final event that afternoon or evening, I was out because my time was slow. Mm-hmm. How did that feel? Oh, it hit me because, yeah. you know, I had my goals pointed before the Olympic Games. Mm-hmm. And I was hoping that there would be three Hawaii swimmers on that relay team. And I didn't make it on there in the finals. So mm-hmm. That kind of hurt. Did it sour you on swimming a little bit? No, it didn't. It didn't. Uh, well, maybe I, I should I take it back. It did from the standpoint that, you know, you reach a goal, you achieve the goal, it kind of, it's kind of a letdown after not getting to the finals. And I was coming into my senior year at the NCAAs in the Big Ten, and I kind of gave up swimming at that point. From the standpoint of, I achieved the goal that I was pointing for. My senior year, 57, it was kind of a letdown because I didn't have the drive as I did in the past. After all the time and sacrifice that Sonny had put into swimming, it's understandable that he would be disheartened. He had come so close to taking home a medal, and yet due to a technicality, he hadn't. But life went on. But then, did you find more meaning than kind of changing direction and, and instilling swimming into other people? Yeah, then my direction my uh, change from the standpoint I was always seeking small goals, short-term goals. Once you achieve the goal, move on to the next and so on. After graduating from university, Sonny was drafted into the U.S. Army where he served until 1960. So what would you say your goal, overarching goal was after you stopped swimming? After I stopped swimming, was, my goal was to get a job. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Going, going to the work field. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wanted to come home, first mm-hmm. of all, mm-hmm. So which I did. Mm-hmm. And I spent uh, 33 years at Kamehameha Schools. Mm-hmm. Following his time in the military, Sonny once again dedicated himself to the water. But this time, it wasn't as a competitive swimmer. Instead, it was as an educator. It's been more than half a century since then, and the list of all that Sonny has accomplished is far too long to go over here. I realized about myself later on. I had to do different projects, do all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't sit still. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, if I sit still, am I enjoying life? Yeah. You know? Aside from his more than 30 years as a teacher and coach at Kamehameha Schools, Sunny has also been an American Red Cross water safety instructor. He has taught scuba. He has served as Chairman Emeritus of the Island of Hawaii YMCA Corporate Board. He's also been the President of the Hawaii Swimming Hall of Fame. And he's organized spearfishing and diving tournaments. And so much more. Sunny has also had two books published. Spearfishing on the Island of Hawaii and the Evolution of Free Diving and History of Spearfishing in Hawaii. Not too long ago, Sonny finished his third book. This one is called Once Upon a Time Memoir of a Hilo Waterman. It's basically his autobiography, but he doesn't intend to publish it. Instead, he wrote it because he wanted to leave something behind for his family and future generations. He wrote it so that they have something to look back on when they decide they want to learn more about Sunny and the Japanese side of their family. Today, Sunny lives in Honolulu, and he has many more stories to share, so I decided to call him up and have him share a few more with us. You're going to get to hear that conversation after this quick break. (laughs) 
Transmissions from Hawaii is looking for advertisers. So if you would like to get the word out about your business, then please consider advertising on this podcast. One of the great things about advertising on a podcast is that once your advertisement is in an episode, it stays there. So it doesn't matter if somebody's listening today, tomorrow, or five years from now, that advertisement is still going to be there. And given that our episodes are generally quite evergreen, and what that means is that it doesn't matter whether you're listening today or five years from now, it's still going to be a good story that you're going to want to listen to. That means that your advertisement is going to be listened to for years to come. So if you want to support us and make sure that we can keep bringing you more content like this and you want to get the word out about your business, then please consider advertising on this show. For more information, please contact us at info at transmissionsfromhawaii.com. Again, that's info at transmissionsfromhawaii.com. As I mentioned before the break, recently I called up Sonny and we had a little chat over the phone. He told me a couple news stories and uh, we talked a little bit about the Waikiki Natatorium War Memorial. Now, in case you're not aware, the Natatorium was opened in 1927 and it served as one of the most important hubs for swimming here in Hawaii for about 50 years. Uh, unfortunately, for now over 40 years, it has not been open to the public and uh, it seems to be in a state of uh, disrepair and it's unknown what exactly will happen there if it will be able to be reopened at some point in the future. Future. Nevertheless, uh, Sonny tells us uh, a really interesting story that took place at the natatorium, uh, as well as a few other things. Um, so, what about the the natatorium? Like, could you tell me a little bit about that? Like, where was it, and and uh, like, what was it like? Okay, well, you know, uh, the Nat Farm has a great history. Mm-hmm. It was built in 1927, and it's down by. Uh, you, you know where it is down by Kaimana Beach, mm-hmm. right next door. Okay, uh, that pool had many competitions uh, available to a lot of international and national swimming people that came to Hawaii to compete. Yeah, and uh, recall uh, that was a hundred meter pool by forty meters saltwater pool and outdoors. And when I swam there in nineteen fifties. The crowds were packed, 7,000 people or more, Uh and on both sides of the natatorium. And those were uh, days that were uh, in the swimming heydays. And in 1927, when that was completed, Duke Kahanamoku did a ceremonial plunge into the Uh natatorium. And, you know, the 1920 and 1924 Olympic, uh, U.S. Olympic swimming team Uh was primarily made up of uh, Hawaii swimmers, men, men folks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and those were the dominant days of swimming. And then, of course, uh, uh, late on the war came and the net farm was closed to... uh, for civilian use, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I've heard you talk a little bit about, like, some of the, uh, how it was, like, swimming back then, for example, like, with goggles, right? Like, people didn't used to use goggles back then? Or, or I guess you made your yeah, own? Yeah, no, we, we didn't use goggles. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in 1949, when I first started swimming uh-huh. uh, in Hilo at the Naval Air Station pool, uh, after... A month or so of uh, eye burns with uh, <laughs> chemicals in the water. Uh-huh. I had my uh, what do you call wooden goggles that I use for spearfishing. Oh. And I said, you know, uh, I think this will be a good thing to use. And so I started using it. And then the older people on the swimming team said, "Hey, kid, you know, take off your goggles. It won't be a whip." <laughs> <laughs> So I guess I I felt that I was pressured out of using it, mm-hmm. and uh, I thought, well, maybe the older people know better than I do. So <laughs> I took it off and, uh, you know, continued swimming that way. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it took until 1970s, oh, uh, I think about 72, 76, when this guy, Wolke from Great Britain, uh-huh. won the 200-meter uh, uh, breaststroke and 100 meter breaststroke in swimming uh-huh. and he used the goggles and after that you know it was revolutionized 
swimming all the way around. And mm. here I had, I could have had a patent for competitive <laughs> swimming. <laughs> but so, of course, you know, yeah. uh, Japan, uh, Okinawa, uh, people were using uh, wooden goggles. They made it. Interesting. And I believe, yeah, I believe that when the Okinawa people came to Hawaii, that they were the ones that uh, really brought out the goggles to Interesting. Uh, local diving. Yeah. Huh. So, yeah. but d- did you guys make your own goggles? Uh, well, you know, we could buy it for about a couple of dollars back uh-huh. in those days. But uh, if we didn't have the money, uh, people made them out of hardwood. Uh-huh. Because hardwood was uh, buoyant, soft, and easy to uh, cut with a uh, knife. Uh-huh. And, uh, of course, the glass was the hardest part to put in there. Yeah. And at times when you didn't have the glue to use, people were using tar from the road. Uh-huh. They'd pick up the tar on a hot, sunny day because it was nice and gooey and pliable. Wow. People would put the on the edge, beveled edge, uh-huh. and press the glass down on top of it because when you went underwater, the water pressure would push the glass into the beveled edge huh. with a tar. Yeah. Huh. That's how they uh, prevented uh, leakage. Wow. Yeah. And they used the rubber tires, you know, the old rubber tires. Yeah. They would cut pieces and tie it uh, with strings to the, what do you call it? side of the goggles to so that it was uh pliable and uh what do you call it you know so it could fit the face right easier. right right huh. yeah um what about uh <laughs> I, I remember this story that you told about swimming at the natatorium with and then there was a, a barracuda in the pool <laughs> oh yeah you, you know uh interesting enough uh, yeah. uh the barracuda and and the natatorium uh, you know, I had never saw it in all the years I uh, swam uh-huh. there from 1950s to the seven, uh, 57. But in 1956, after we made the Olympic team in uh, Detroit, Michigan, uh, five Hawaii swimmers came home, and plus we had three more mainland swimmers that swam with Coach Sakamoto. Uh-huh. And anyway, what we would do is we would swim there early in the morning from eight o'clock to about one o'clock. And then we'd go home for lunch and then take a nap and come back from practice to practice from four until dark. Wow. And uh, anyway, this went on and for several months. And, you know, you get tired of a routine that goes on. So one day I decided, oh, heck, I'm going to go up to the diving tower. There's a 10 meter tower and a, and on the Makai side of the Natatorium. So uh-huh. I went up there a beautiful morning. I'm looking out to sea and looking down at Waikiki and to Diamond Head. And then I faced the uh, Malka facing Diamond Head, actually. And I looked down into the pool. And so I see uh, Bill Woolsey, my teammate, yeah. swimming. He dives in the water and he starts swimming. And all of a sudden he's coming towards the... Uh, middle of the pool where I'm on the top of the 10 meter tower, I look down and I see this big shadow, five foot shadow, <laughs> slim one, uh, you know, swimming just about three feet from his foot, from mm-hmm. his kicking. And I watched this and I couldn't believe it. And I said, I kind of yelled down to Bill. I said, hey, there's a big barracuda, you know, swimming. <laughs> and he just kept swimming because he couldn't hear me. Yeah. And he swam all the way down to the far end of the pool, the Waikiki end of the pool. Uh-huh. And then I saw the barracuda disappear. Then after he pushed off the wall, swimming back toward the diamond end of the natatorium, I see this uh, fish appear on the surface again, following his kick. And... The thing didn't look like it was moving his tail. It was just stationary, but he actually was moving uh-huh. the same uh-huh. speed as Bill Wolsey was swimming. And I watched this a couple of times, and I, I tried to tell the rest of the swimming team members, eight of us who were training with Sakamoto, uh-huh. and I even told Coach, I said, there's a big barracuda, and nobody believed me. <laughs> and they, I don't think they wanted to believe me. <laughs> But anyway, what happened was that I said, you know, later on, I said, hey, Ford, uh, this is Ford Corner. I said, Ford, you got to come up and 
see this. I, I said, you know, nobody believes me. You've got to come up. And so Ford came up, and it was the same thing occurring. When the guys were swimming, the Barracuda was falling three feet, three feet in the back. And uh, anyway, which Ford was, uh, what do you call it, trying to tell the people, nobody believed them either. <laughs> so this went on, and we figured out, oh, we'll forget about it. Yeah. Went on, on to Australia to swim. Yeah. And uh, never thought about that, uh, what do you call incident about the Barracuda until, uh, you know, years later, about uh, 2004, I think, or 2008, mm -hmm. they asked uh, some of the Olympians to write down some of their interesting stories about uh, swimming. Yeah. And I, I uh, you know, I sent that into the USA Swimming, but they never published it because I don't think they believed it either. <laughs> But uh, but years later, uh, what do you call? Uh, I had a what do you call a meeting with uh, some divers, and we're sitting down talking stories. And I just happened to tell some of the guys on the spearfishing uh, group uh, what I had witnessed back in 1956, training for the Olympic Games. And one guy said, "Oh, I worked for the uh, City and County Board of Water Supply." And the mayor sent us to Waikiki. This was back in 1997 or 98, somewhere. And he wanted us to check the natatorium because they're talking about restoration of, of the uh, pool. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what happened was that he said, when he went there to check, they said they saw on the Waikiki end, they saw a squirrel, and they saw a five-foot shark, uh -huh. six-foot shark swimming around the white tip. Oh. <laughs> so, wow. uh, they, you know, they, they were kind of surprised. They didn't say anything. Yeah. And uh, so they just left it at that. Yeah. But he said about four or five years later, they were sent back to the pool. So they said, oh, they, they want to see if that shark was still in the pool. Uh -huh. And they couldn't find it. And then somebody saw it lying down on the bottom of the sand. Huh. And you could see the gills, you know, opening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they faced the current a lot of times. Huh. But there was a, the same white tip shark in there. But I, I believe that uh, someone must have hooked the shark, you know, small, when it was small, oh, mm -hmm. and threw it into the natatorium. Right, right, right. Because, uh, you know, they wouldn't be able to fit coming into the openings because... Uh, the openings are real narrow. Yeah. Right, right, right. But that was the uh, incident of the uh, <laughs> funny uh, wake up barracuda. Barracuda, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I guess you know, like like you said, there were like narrow openings, kind of basically to let the water in. But um, you know, like yeah. I guess a thin kind of narrow fish like a barracuda could squeeze on by. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like. Well, I think the barracuda love still waters. When they come in, they are small, uh -huh. and then they can grow big because that natatorium had a lot of fish in it. Oh. Uh -huh. and, yeah, and only, uh, uh, what do you call it, Diamond Head and the natatorium. Mm -hmm. You know, you got San Susi Beach, mm -hmm. uh, Kaimana Beach. Yeah. That was not a beach like that at all, like it is today. Uh -huh. It was because of the natatorium that jutted out that collected all that sand to form that beach. Oh. Yeah. Uh, before, if you look at the wall, which is right back to where the, um, the volleyball courts, the basketball courts, uh, or the, where they parked the car, mm -hmm. it used to run parallel, uh, parallel to the uh, highway before. Mm -hmm. hmm. And that has all, uh, what do you call, accumulated over the years. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And when I first uh, came to Natatorium, uh, we used to run on the, uh, what do you call it, Natatorium deck uh, mm -hmm. on the side of the rail. And when the uh, salt swells came in in the summertime and dive into it and oh. we played and we had to go into the um, rocky coral sand area mm -hmm. to climb up uh, and get out of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, so... You know, that, uh, all the uh, vents, uh, or the, what do you call, holes for ventilation for the, uh, uh, what do you call, water currents in there, mm -hmm. were covered up by the sand. Uh, 
Mm. But uh, over a period of years, the net drum had cracks on the wall. Oh. And that's where the fish could come in. Oh, okay. But it housed quite a lot of fish wow. back in the old days. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and then, like, on a personal note, I mean, what would you say, like, all this time, you know, swimming and, and fishing, you know, has, has taught you? Is there anything that you can say that, um, like, a life lesson or something like that, that, that you've gotten from all this time? Well, my, my life lesson out of uh, the ocean mm-hmm. and swimming is that uh, I really find uh, getting into the ocean and into the pool or any form of water, it's really a uh, therapeutic for me. Mm. In other words, when I get into the water, all my outside uh, worries flow away, you know, it just disappears. Yeah. And you're in the water enjoying the element and also the uh, natural beauty of the ocean. Yeah. That takes uh, a really a lot of load off of your mind. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's really a uh, therapeutic. Yeah. If you would like to read the article about Sunny that we ran in the February-March 2019 issue of Wasabi, please see the link in the show notes or at transmissionsfromhawaii.com. That article mentions a few other details that we didn't get to cover in the episode today, so it's definitely worth a read. Transmissions from Hawaii is a production of Wasabi Magazine. It's produced in the beautiful city of Honolulu by me, Tony Vega. If you enjoy the show, then please remember to leave a rating and a review in your podcast app of choice. And don't forget to subscribe or follow in your podcast app. That helps immensely. Another thing that really, really helps us out is if you spread the word on social media or you tell a friend or family member about the show. If you like the stories that we're telling here, then please tell somebody about the show. Help us grow so that this show can be sustainable and so that we can keep bringing you more content like this. Also, don't forget, if you would like to check out full transcripts of each episode, you can find them in the show notes or at transmissionsfromhawaii.com. Mahalo for listening and see you next time on Transmissions from Hawaii.